is freezing. Hi, Chrissy. Let's see, make sure we get this on the right screen. Come on. There we go. Give you guys a second to come in. It is gorgeous and blue sky, but don't let this fool you. I think with the wind chill, it's about 34 degrees or so. And I uh, regret not bringing gloves with me, but I am so bundled up <clears throat> that I um, can hardly move. <laughs> Underneath my coat, I have my heat tech, my Uniglo heat tech. And if you come to Paris or if you're anywhere that's cold, you have got to go right now to Uniglo or go on their website and get their stuff called heat tech. It's the greatest stuff in the world. It's really lightweight, um, very, very thin. Um, and you can wear it under, they have all sorts of different pieces like tank tops or long sleeve and scoop neck and turtlenecks and all sorts of stuff and long under like uh, leggings kind of, but um, you wear them under your clothes and I even have the socks on. I got all the heat tech stuff. So it's no match to the wind, but we'll persevere. Give everybody a second here. And we are, Kind of, again, for the third week in a row, we are starting kind of where we started last week. So the last two weeks, so now this is the third week that we're basically starting within a block of the Palais Royale. <clears throat> and so we are up now um, and we are gonna go into the gallery, Vivia. One of the gorgeous passages, probably I think the best of them. There's, uh, there's so uh, quite a few of them here on the, right bank but i think the gallery vivian there it is i think it's definitely the prettiest of all of them look at those cute little piggies there is a restaurant here <clears throat> that used to be in the uh, jean paul gautier he had his uh atelier here and so now it is this beautiful restaurant the italian restaurant but look at all the way up the mirrored ceiling but then they have this really cool um Ferns and stuff on the wall. I just was making a note that a friend of mine and I need to go there. <laughs> but this passage um, was originally built in 1823. And just like the street next to us, Vivian is a, was the was named after one of the mayors of early Paris. And he had the property here. And right across the street was the Richelieu, uh, the BNF Richelieu. And so they, uh, that's where on the other side between Colbert and Richelieu and Mazarin, they all lived in this area. So these were basically kind of their first malls in a sense, because it was a way for people to get off the dirty gross street and be able to walk under no matter what the, what the weather was, if it was raining, they could still get through here. And this ceiling and the tiles, and all the decorations in here are original. So it's 200 years old. And this one's really cool because it kind of has three different exits, three different ways to come through. And here's this amazing bookstore. This is all, this dates back to 1880, this bookstore. And it's a good thing um, when I come, it's never open. I just look in the window and find things I want. But it's supposed to be open at 11 o'clock on Saturdays. And I came by here yesterday at about 12 and it still wasn't open. That's just kind of how things work here <laughs> in general. But look at how great this is. It's so beautiful. And I love this little tea shop. I'll get a little closer, but look at the little sign outside for the tea. And they made it from the design and the mosaics. And these mosaics were done by an Italian Sacchinia, which he did these and uh, he created all this mosaic and they restored a bunch of this stuff about 10 years ago. But I mean, to think this is all still original is pretty amazing. And on the top, you have all these different symbols um, of commerce. So you had the cadences of Mercury up there, which a lot of people always think look like what you know is um, like the doctors, like the medical board always has that on there, but it is different. So you also have like the palm branch and uh, cornucopia. All of these things are basically about plenty, commerce, it, 
which is perfect because this was a little gallery filled with shops and it still is today. But they used to have really great, um, like Gautier was here. So look at that cute little slide. Gautier was here and a bunch of other designers um, and very high-end um, businesses way back even in um, the early 20th century. And now it's a lot of, you know, you have some ready to wear. Look at the store here. They always have amazing things. Look at those things. Oh, and those are fake. <laughs> I have a big issue with fake flowers. So imagine how much I love the explosion of them all over the city. Uh, Maison Sauvage in Saint-Germain that did it was the first one to do it about eight or nine years ago. And since then, everybody's been doing it, especially during COVID. And it's just gotten to be a little much. And it's like not even real flower colors or just, it's just, it's, it's just getting over, going overboard. Like a little is enough. This um, here, this uh, Louis Le Grand, this is uh, Lucien Le Grand. It's a really, really cool wine shop and wine bar. Uh, definitely go check this out if you are here. Um, this also dates back to about 1879. Um, so this is a really, really cool one. They are so nice in there and helpful. If there's anything you want, they are really helpful in helping you uh, find it and decide on what you want to drink. And then we're gonna turn back around and go out the side passage, but here's the very end of this. And this is where the Cafe Vivia is but what is happening here right now this was open <laughs> and now let's go outside and see huh everything is closed up um i hope they're just doing a little remodel that would be uh really sad if it closed this place is really great. Like it was literally, it was, it was open just a few days ago. But because upstairs they have the greatest bathroom in the world, you go up there and let's see if you could still see. Hang on here. No. Up there in that little corner in the right square corner. They have the bathroom is up there and it's like walking into like a Paris bordello. And it's amazing. It has like big ostrich feather lamps and a button that says push for champagne and a big like pink velvet tufted chairs and couches. And it's, it's just my dream. <laughs> I wish one of these places were open today and had some gloves. So we're going to go out here to the side. And look, this is another super cute cafe. I should have done this backwards and ended up here and tucked inside and had something warm. Not a lot of bakers sitting outside today. But it is beautiful. Look how beautiful today is. It is just very chilly. And we have the the Bourse down there. Or I'm sorry, the the former stock exchange, which was also called the Bourse, but what we know now is the Bourse. We'll also see. We'll walk past that today. And this little street here, not to be confusing, is called the Passage de Petit Père because this was a whole convent um, in this area and they were called the Little Fathers. So they got to keep that little name. And here we have the gorgeous church that is Notre Dame de Victoire. I'll tell you about that in a minute. We'll pop in there, but I popped in there for a second before we started and my boots I'm wearing made so much noise on the marble that I don't know how far we want to go in because I just don't want to I don't like to be too disruptive in a church um but this is a passe toire and it is adorable 
and you have a great little tea shop over there. They try to say that they're one of the oldest because there is a Demont, but it smelled different that was mentioned in 1629, um, but they actually aren't the oldest. Um, again, I've said this before, anytime anything says it is the oldest in Paris, it's a pretty good bet that it is not. Um, the Procope tries to say they're the oldest. Uh, the Tour d'Argent says it's the oldest. But these are like, this is kind of saying like, this is the oldest. It's, it's really, it, you're on pretty shaky ground. Oh my goodness. Um, but that's actually true. But they do have really great tea. I'm going to turn from the window a second. Uh, but it's just really cute because you have all these little Notre Dames up there, our ladies. And let's pop in here for, I just want to watch all the, the kids. It's a really beautiful church. And this is one of the many churches that Louis XIII had built because he made that vow. I wrote about that a couple weeks ago um, on my Instagram. And you could read that, the story about that with, with it relates to Notre Dame du Paris, the big church, our beloved church. Um, but this vow also went across to other church, having other churches built. This was built after um, the siege of uh, La Rochelle. And so he had this built and even laid the first stone here on December 8, 1629. But it was also, there's also a little story about this church that in um, November of 1637, there was a brother, Brother uh, Fiac, and he had a visit from uh, Our Lady. So the Virgin came and visited him in a, in a dream at three different times. And in those three different times, she said, you need to go and um, get these three different churches. You need to do this uh, nine days of prayer. And then at the end of that, we, God will... Um, give you a son. Well, the reason he would hear these voices is because he was woken up um, at night by the sound of a child crying. And so he thought that was, you know, he thought that was Christ that was crying, but it was, in fact, it was going to be the baby that God said he was going to give to France. And almost nine months later, Louis the 14th was born. So Louis the chosen. Um, and you wonder why the guy had such a big ego. I mean, if you were told by everybody that you were uh, chosen by God. Um, if you grew up with being told that, oh boy, no wonder he was a, thought he could do whatever he wanted. But we're gonna, um, I hear some music in there, but we will pop in there quickly and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Oh, come on. Merci, merci. The good thing was the music covered up my 
shoes. <laughs> the bad thing was that I didn't want to go too far, but it was nice because you have that little upper side chapel. It's the way they have that church set up that I was able to kind of sneak down there real quick for you. But I don't like, uh, especially if people are praying, I kind of don't like to film that because people are having their own moment doing whatever it is that they need. This is a great little place. So look at how gorgeous it is today. So we're gonna head over here. So one of my the whole one of the whole reasons why I decided to do this today, which is usually how I pick everything, is there's one specific thing I really want to share with you guys, and then I just build around that. And this is twofold because even though we're way up here, this has to do with the Louvre, which everything in my life all roads lead back to the Louvre. And I'll tell you why. Because we are in the Place de and you see that guy in there in the center, Louis XIV, Louis the Fourteenth. Look at he's got. Look at the sun is on him. Louis XIV, the you know, chosen by God, given as a gift to Anne of Austria. Her father might not have been Louis the Thirteenth, but you know, that's one of those stories. We'll never know. But so here we are, the Place de Victoire, which is amazing. Oh, it's a little bit. Look at that sun. Just look at that light there for a second. And so this whole area around here was created in 1685. And it was uh, created and they built a statue dedicated to Louis XIV that was um, to mark the end and this treaty of the Treaty of Nemeon. And this was basically a treaty that ended the war they had with the Dutch um, over the empire, Holland, Spain, and uh, Boudreaux, which is um, ended up being what we think of as Germany. And so they wanted to have, you know, of course you need a, a monument built to him because he did this great thing. And if you watch that TV show, uh, Versailles, there's part of it, quite a few episodes I think it's season three when they talk about the Dutch war and William uh, William of Orange, all that stuff. So he wanted to have this uh, statue built. Nothing that you see here today is from that from that original statue, but the uh, very first one was here in 1678 or 1685. And it was uh, inaugurated on March 28, 1686. And it stood until 1792. And of course, you know what that is. That's the revolution. And so when the revolution happened, um, the revolutionaries um, ended up shooting down the statue of Louis XIV and he was different. So here we now see him on a horse. The original one was he was standing um, and he was standing in this great victor victorious pose and he was being crowned with a laurel wreath by victory behind him. And it was on a very, very uh, large column. On the base of it, it had uh, four different huge, huge bas-relief plaques that had different scenes um, from that treaty, uh, from that war. And then around the bottom, it had the four captives. And then it also had about 28 other pieces that were all done in bronze. That, the reason why I wanted to do this is because those pieces, except for Louis, are now in the Louvre. So everything was, uh, was retained and saved except for the statue of Louis. And so he was destroyed. And then they, after that, they decided they were going to put up a pyramid. So, you know, when everybody freaks out, some people still don't like the pyramid at the Louvre. Again, it's not completely out of the norm. People think, why a pyramid? That's weird. What does it have to do with the Louvre or Paris? But there were pyramids here before. I've t I'll tell the story that um, before there was the one at the Louvre, there was two there before that. One was done by Napoleon Bonaparte. The other was done by November, no, Napoleon the Third. And it was light, lit on fire on um, Saint Napoleon Day, which is August 15th, which uh, is his birthday, which never really took off. And, you know, we don't celebrate that today. But so there was a pyramid here. It was made of wood and the way they held it together that was when it was said that when it got so hot in the summer sun, it literally just fell apart. 
<laughs> it just collapsed. So I'm not sure if they just glued it together what they did back then, uh, but that was destroyed. And then after that, there was a statue of a very tall nude statue of uh, General De, De Jay. He was a general under Napoleon and he was here. And then people got upset because they thought it was a little too revealing of a giant statue in the middle of the street. And so somebody covered his nether regions up with a, uh, with a fence. And then that eventually came down and that was melted down um, and their Louis, uh, Louis the 18th that was melted down and used to create the Henry the fourth that we now have on the Pont Neuf. So I guess his little exposed nether regions are now part of Henry the fourth, which is makes sense because Henry the fourth was quite the ladies man. So here uh, on the Place de Victoire, there's some really cool buildings. Um, all of these buildings, um, are original to that time, except for some of them have been made smaller when they cut through some of the roads. Uh, the Etienne over here, um, that one was made bigger, so some of these buildings were uh, cut in, cut down a little bit. This one, I love this building over here because I love how it has this little cut out on the top. Excuse me for my sniffles, guys. Um, it uh, has a little cut out up there little silhouette of Louis the 14th up there and there's another one too but this building here this gorgeous building can you can see up there um was all part of a um it belonged to the gentleman I'm gonna get run over um it belonged to it was a, a hotel Rambouillet de la Sablière and this was basically owned by the one of the richest men in France at the time uh, in the 17th century he was a um, he had one of the farmer's wall, which basically was a tax collector. He was incredibly, incredibly wealthy. So he had this huge home built and it basically goes this whole entire block. They um, ended up in 1960 uh, making this so it was all historic monument. So before that, um, some people were able to go in here and change some things, which is pretty much mostly this building right here. So most everything else looks relatively the same. Um, but this one was also, he had a daughter and his daughter's name was Marguerite. And I think now I need to do a podcast episode about her when I started looking it up. Um, she had this huge salon that had everybody coming there. Jean de La Fontaine, Ninon de Close, um, Madame de Sevigny, who was an amazing woman who, um, two of those we have done a podcast about Ninon and, um, Sevigny. And she was a woman of letters and she in the 17th century, and uh, early 18th century basically documented everything that happened in her letters to her uh, daughter that she sent to her who lived down south. And uh, basically she was like the reporter, uh, gossip columnist, everything. But you could buy her letters. Um, you could buy books with her letters in it and they're really great. But look at how gorgeous that place is. I think that would work out just fine for me. That size is perfect. One whole side could be my library. <laughs> which um, I'm pretty much going to be just living on books at some point here. But you can see Louis back here. He's pretty, uh, I love coming here. I stayed here um, one time just down, just straight down the street. And I would come, get up early in the morning and come down here and see the sunrise uh, from behind Louis, which is pretty cool. But it, this is, can be a little bit of a treacherous uh, treacherous little intersection and it sits between the first and the second so one side of the street is the second and the other side of the street is the first but you can see over here look i'll show you there's the sun king with the sun but you can see him again jeez lady i don't need to get run over by a bike a second time um you can see he's over here on this corner too you see that up there plus david Clark. Pretty cool. I love it. This is actually one of the only statues you will see of Louis. Um, the original statue of him with his legs, with a horse with his legs up. There's, of course, the one in front of the of the Louvre uh, by Bernini. But originally, it did not have his legs up. It was changed over time because Louis hated it. <laughs> Louis hated that Bernini. He brought Bernini all the way up to Paris from Italy and actually wanted him to design part of the Louvre. and he did some designs that they were they were thinking about using for the back for the colonnade, and they just never used it. So he ended up making the statue for Louis that's in front of the Louvre, and Louis was like, "Yeah, I don't like it," and stuck it in like the farthest corner possible of his uh, property out at Versailles. 
which is celebrating its 400th birthday this year. They haven't really announced anything that they're doing yet. That's again, another one of those very loose, very loose uh, historical guidelines, I think, because they're tracing it back to when it was a teeny tiny hunting lodge of, uh, of his father, Louis the 13th, who had that out there and he'd go hunting, which if you go to Versailles and you look at it, you're walking up and you're walking through the main gate and you look the very center of the building that was, but just a portion of the center was the original hunting lodge. And then um, Louis the 14th, of course, added on to it. But Louis would go out there hunting and sometimes little Louis the 14th would come but he had only let Anne of Austria come for the day and then she had to come back to Paris because Louis liked to hang out with his buddies. Didn't want his wife around. I'll let you read between the lines on that one. <laughs> so here, this building, this gorgeous building over here is the Bank of France. But one building I have loved since I first came because the first trip time, first, very first trip I came in um, September 2016, I also stayed over here. I stayed just off of Rue Saint Anne, which is where we were last week. And I, I don't know why, but I've always loved this building. One thing I love about it is, wait till I get over here, um, is the fact that you have the old. I love it when you have the old uh, street sign when they used to actually just edge them into there. But it has always looked like this for six, seven years now, going on seven years. It's always looked like this where it's like falling apart. Let me get it. And little, those little uh, nets kind of holding it all together. But I just look at the light and the light bouncing off of it from the windows. I just, if I can't live at that other one over there, I'll take this one. Is it this how this works? Putting it out there to the universe. Uh, but look at that. I bet that could be just heavenly with those that rounded. Could you just imagine what that on that first level with the balcony, what it looks like? I'm going to see what else I could find. Maybe I could find some pictures of the inside. But the bank, the Banque de France there is a, uh, used to be called the Hotel Toulouse. And uh, let me to get across the street here. I guess see it a little bit better. Plus, the street's all closed off over here. This is one of those buildings that you cannot go in except for, you know what, that third weekend of September. And it is a must. If you are here, go inside this one. So it is basically takes up this whole entire block. And it's a couple of different buildings. This building here on the right is, part, is at the actual Hotel de Toulouse. And this was um, built originally in 1635 by Mansart. And then in 1713, it was purchased by Louis Alexandre de Bourbon. He was the legitimate son of Louis XIV and Madame de Montespan. Madame de Montespan was his favorite. And they had seven children together. And Madame de Maintenon, who came along next, uh, convinced Louis to make them all legitimate. Madame de Maintenon also went on to become his second kind of secreted wife. She never was queen. They kind of got married in secret um, and nobody really knew, but uh, she had a great, great sway over Louis. And I did a podcast episode about both of those women. But Madame de Montespan is going to come up tomorrow in tomorrow's podcast, which I'll tell you about in a second. But the Bank de France here, um, Ale, uh, Louis de Alexander lived here. And inside of it, he had many of the same designers that were working on Versailles work on this. And so inside of it, it has this one huge space called the Gallery uh, d'Or. And so it was, it's a golden gallery. And it's like a miniature uh, Gallery de Palon. Uh, the Hall of Mirrors. It's absolutely gorgeous. The ceiling is all painted with uh, the story of Apollo, but then it also features um, 
uh, Anne of Austria and Louis the 14th in it and Louis the 13th. So he was kind of putting up the whole family up in there, but it is absolutely gorgeous. So it's this side of it. You see, there's two buildings um, that are connected here um, and the Hotel de Toulouse is on this side, uh, but it is absolutely amazing. And she also, another one we've done a podcast about also had something to do with this. And it was a favorite of Marie Antoinette, Chrissy. And <laughs> Chrissy's ears just perked up and it was Princess Nambal. And she ended up marrying, excuse me, the son of, of uh, Louis Alexander. And he was just a, just a tad. He'd already been married before. And uh, he was only briefly married and the wife died. And so then he ended up marrying Princess Nabal because she also came, her side of her family came from a very wealthy family. And so that's what he did back then. And, but he married her and then he just kept going on his cavorting ways that he did. He was just 20 years old when he died, uh, basically because he had a venereal disease that he also gave poor Princess Nabal. She did not actually end her life very well either because she was killed by the guillotine because she was good friends with Marie Antoinette. But she was very close with uh, her crappy husband's father and he took very good care of her after uh, he died. But we did a podcast episode about her too. So we're gonna head down here. My right hand is frozen. <laughs> But it's nice and quiet over here, except for when I was walking over here about a half an hour ago, um, there was standstill on the Rue de Rivoli. So we'll see what's going on because we're going to end up back down there um, because there was some sort of a protest. I saw a bunch of French flags and I, loudspeakers and lots of police cars. So who knows what they were demonstrating, but it's always something. But again, you have to pretty much be right on top of it to know um, there's a lot of Facebook forums that people are always in a panic about the strikes and pickpockets and everything else. The strikes when that happens here, um, especially when it's a Metro strike, it does snarl kind of everything. Just make sure you just stay on foot everywhere you go those days. They announce it in advance, just plan, plan accordingly. Make sure you're not gonna, like that's not the day you're gonna go to Versailles, take the Metro. And then just pack some patients. I flew in on the day of the strike and it just meant that it took me an hour and 45 minutes to get in from the city on a taxi um, instead of the normal 45 minutes to an hour. But you'll be fine, everything will be fine. Just remember, just go with the flow. We're gonna come back over here and tell you about that amazing building that everybody always has a question about. But we're straight ahead is the Bourse de Commerce, which is now a museum. It was built in 1763. Let's see if I go out here. What's this car doing? You can see it down there. Built in 1763, it was for the wheat exchange. So well, it was called the Bourse, it was uh, not the full stock exchange that we think of that we talked about last week, but it was mostly commodities and wheat. Um, but it was given by the mayor, well, rented to uh, Francois Pinot, and he is a extremely wealthy man. He originally owned the Caring Corporation that owns Gucci and YSL and Balenciaga, all of those. And uh, now his son runs it and he just plays with his art. So inside here, it's his contemporary art collection, plus mostly all special exhibits. Very, it's a, uh, you see how it's a circular shape in that dome. If you're not a big fan of contemporary art, which I'm not, but I did go in there because I wanted to see the space. It is amazing inside. The ceiling alone, that dome, is completely painted with um, scenes of commerce around the world, which is kind of cool, done in the 19th century. Okay. Um, the next passage we're going to see, unfortunately, is closed today because it's Sunday, but I'll take you around on both sides so you can see it. 
Josephine. And we're on this cute little street. Can anybody spot what I love about this street yet? So this is a Rue uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a philosopher of the Enlightenment. And this building right here on this side of the street, if we were walking on the other one, other side, other street across is the Rue de Louvre on the other side. And it is, uh, you see part of the back of the wall of Philippe Auguste. Holy moly, but look at this. <gasps> That's right. So this shop, which I saw that bag yesterday, all closed up. This is the one, this is the shop they have only for special orders where you could have them actually create something for you. I think that would be the, I think that'd be my next level obsession if I'm doing that. <laughs> but look at this. So this is the same knocker that you see over on Rue Bonaparte on that amazing building that Manet was born in. I just love these. So this right here, this one though, look at that bag. This here, a number 19, is the very first store that that wonderful man right there, Christian Louboutin, opened. Oh, a cute pink bag. I should be looking at the camera, I'm looking in the window. Um, this is the very first store he ever had. So this is a store that he had his workshop in and he had, oh, what's that trying to smoke? I think I need to wipe that. Oh, you see that spinning around? Look at that. Oh. But this is the very first store. So when I learned that, that this is where I have bought my thing, my pieces that I have bought, um, I have bought it here and I will only buy them here because I think it's so cool that this was his very, very first store. He opened it November 21st, 1991. You can see it right here. Maybe I'll put this in here. So this is the uh, Gallery Vero Doda. And this was actually opened by two butchers. So it was two different butchers that had shops around here in this area. And they decided that they wanted to have a way that they could have people um, be able to shop and do get around and come to their stores. It was very smart of them to do this at the time. So this was um, what they decided to create. It was open in 1826. So it's just a few years older than the other one. And then they did the, yeah. But the ceiling, is, this one's really gorgeous. The ceiling is all painted with different goddesses. And then you have this great black and white tile floor. Um, but here you have uh, Louboutin here, and there's the Louboutin men's store over here. There's a couple other, there's a really great handbag store that makes beautiful leather in there. There's actually a store that has gloves. Um, there's a couple art stores, there's a hair store, um, but there is also down here at number 10 is a place um, called uh, Minou, uh, and it is actually the only authorized uh Per, uh, store to actually be able to repair Louboutin shoes and he told they told me that when the red wears off you just bring it in there and they will redo it and on my boots that I have they will redo it and put kind of the plastic or not the plastic but the rubber sole that's on the bottom of my tennis shoes that are stamped with Louboutin so you know I was like okay I'm just gonna wear them around so I can have that right away <laughs> get the camera out of here but the, it is really beautiful in here and there are still um apartments uh, up, up up above and in one of them at number 23 is where rachel felix lived rachel felix we also did an episode about her she was the very first international um star that was an actor and she um ended up actually performing all over europe she even went to america and then she died when she was just like 30 years old um but she also had an affair with um Napoleon Bonaparte's illegitimate son. And then she also had an affair with Napoleon III. <laughs> so, uh, but she she also um, lived, she was lived and died um, in the uh, Passe Vosges. So she had a bunch of really great uh, different uh, locations, but this is a really, really pretty passage. Um, and I posted a picture of my stories yesterday and I'll put some of these pictures on my um, website under the notes for this walk. And there is a cafe that was on the left-hand side that has the French cafe chairs, but the backs of the chairs were shaped like hearts. They were so cute, but it's such a really great little um, 
passage and right now today with this wind, it would be very welcome to go in. But here's the men's store in case there's any, you know, gentleman that needs some new, uh, new tennis shoes. We're kind of gonna go weave around. We're gonna go down this cute little street over here. And then we'll go back and I'll show you the front side of the passage as I almost tripped on that curb. Oh boy, it's a jelly. So this cute little street is called the Rue du Pelican. But <laughs> you think, oh, that's so cute. It's named after a pelican. It's kind of a play of words because this at one time was outside the wall of the city and outside the wall of the city, it was legal for prostitution. So this street and this little area around here was a place where you had a lot of prostitution. And Pelican is actually a play on Poil au Camp. And so it was a term that they used for prostitutes. And so this little, uh, this little cute little street, because they could, uh, you know, come down here and be, kind of closed away. So this is a really cute little restaurant right here. Um, I've gone there a couple of times. It's really great. So what's even better on this little street is right here. This has been here actually for quite a while. Look at that. Some child to cast by Jack. And that's not in chalk. It's usually you're always in chalk, but how cute is that? I was sitting here one day and uh, Cafe Blanc um, and looked up and there it was. So this building here is the Ministry of Culture, which actually also has, um, it's like the high ranking people are in the Palais Royale. But this building here is all part of the Ministry of Culture. And so it has a quite an interesting facade. And what that facade is, and maybe I will, I'll put a picture um, of this on the website so you can see if you could figure it out. And I kind of, when I look at it, I kind of can. Um, so the outside of it, it's these, they added all these kind of metal pieces onto the whole entire facade. And it is actually from a fresco. Um, by Giulio Romano in the Palazzo Te. And they basically took this fresco and then it put it on a computer and kind of just enlarged it. And so when I looked at it today, I definitely got some of these pieces because the, the, the fresco has like, there's an angel in it, a bunch of other things. And then I was like, okay, I kind of could see the angel wing and some of the other stuff here. But it is really interesting and it's very different. It's very eye-catching, obviously, because it's unlike pretty much any other building. Oh boy. I think I could still hear some of the commotion down here. Yeah, you could. We'll see. So um, has anybody watched that amazing TV show, Dis Corson, um, on Netflix in English, they call it Call My Agent. This is the building that they work in. That's their office building. I'm going to move over here for a second. But this is their office building. And so every time I come here, even though it's a TV show, I'm always like hoping I'll find some. Because if you have not watched that TV show from Netflix, um, it is absolutely fantastic. It's so good. The acting is so good. Uh, Camille Colton, who's in it, is, oh, I love her so much. I saw her one day at a cafe eating and I ran around the block so I could come back and try to be nonchalant by getting a picture with her. But she, in the picture, she's literally staring right at me. <laughs> but she is amazing. Um, and every episode has a different famous French actor playing themselves because it's about a talent agency. So there's some French actors you would know and very randomly in the, in this final season that was just on, or the last season, because they're actually going to make some movies. Um, 
Sigourney Weaver was in it, <laughs> but everybody else in it is French. But a few of them you might actually know, even if you're not a huge French movie connoisseur. So I'm gonna hide under here for a second, even though it's a, we're so close to this church, it's gonna be hard to see. So this church right here, because we are just on the other side of the loo. Let me see if we can get a better place to show you. Oh, I think over here will be good. <clears throat> here we go. So this church is the uh, Oratoire du Louvre, and it is now a um, Protestant church. It's been very cleaned up. It was under scaffolding for quite a long time. But this church was actually first built um, in 1660 as the Chapel of the Louvre. So this was going to be the Royal Chapel of the Louvre because that's the Louvre right there down the street. And so this was, um, and inside of it, it had paintings by uh, Champonnier, it had uh, Charles Lebrun, uh, uh, Simon Vouet, all of these amazing, amazing paintings that were in here, they're all now in the Louvre. Uh, but it was during um, the revolution that they ended up actually having this as a stock exchange for a little while. Like I think just about in the Louvre at one point even was a stock exchange. So the stock exchange just was bouncing all over the place. Um, but it was here that uh, they had the funeral for uh, Cardinal Richelieu and also Louis the Thirteenth and Anne of Austria. So that all happened in here. It's a small church. It's never really open. One time um, I raced over here and I think I was staying like on the far end of Boulevard Saint-Germain, like past uh, Ile Saint-Louis. And I realized that I wanted to come in here and I knew that they did what time they did mass on Sunday. So I like raced up here and I came inside and I thought, okay, I'm finally going to get a glimpse inside. And it's not small. You'll see, I mean, it's not large. Um, and when I got inside, the entire inside of it was covered in scaffolding. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so upset. I finally got in there. And then when I did get in there, um, I got, I could see nothing, <laughs> but the guy was very nice. And he told me, he's like, come back another time. And it's like, well, okay. But like in a couple of years, <laughs> and this is of course the Rue Saint Honoré, which goes quite a ways, turns into the Rue Saint Paul. And Saint, Saint Honoré is of course, maybe our favorite saint because he's, patron saint of bakers and there's that delicious dessert all right <clears throat> so we're going to come here on the back of the church so it's a protestant church now um it was not a protestant church then but it also has a uh, it has a monument on the back of it that's not john charles But back in here, this little side, you could see a monument. Here is the back of the loop. That's the colonnade. Look at that beautiful light over there. It is cold as heck, but it is gorgeous. I was in my apartment. I did not leave my apartment until I came to do this. I was busy doing research and writing all day long. I'm getting ready for this and the podcast and everything else I'm doing. Um, because it looks so cold, but it is so beautiful. So here is this monument. Let's see if I could get a better peek between the, here, let me put this in here for a second, hold on to it. So this right here, you can see his name, Gaspar de Coligny. This is a monument to him. He uh, died in 1572. And how he died was he was a Huguenot, and he decided he was going to become a Protestant a Huguenot. And uh, look at that beautiful girl up there. And so he uh, did that. And this was uh, right about the time that Henry III, who would become Henry IV, was getting married here in Paris. This was about 10 years before that. And so he lived here in Paris. He lived very close to here, just down the street. And um, somebody tried to have him killed. And that somebody was most likely Catherine de Medici and her son, Charles the Knight, and uh, they stabbed him. Uh, somebody stabbed him, and but he didn't die. And so this was on August 22nd, 1572. 
And uh, they went to actually go and visit him. And it was at that time that uh, Catherine and Charles decided again to call for his death. And so two days later on August 24th, 1572, um, man came to his apartment, actually pulled him from his bed, stabbed him, threw him out the window, dragged him through the streets, beheaded him, and then hung him up so everybody could see him that, uh, that they killed him because that was also when this St. Bartholomew Day massacre happened. And that is also something that Catherine de Medici and Charles IX, her son, ordered from the balcony of the Louvre. So if, when people try to tell me maybe she got a bad rap, nope. <laughs> That's like saying Coco Chanel got a bad rap. Nope. But this, this, uh, this, was, this is really cool. It was created and added um, in 1889 on the anniversary, the first anniversary of the uh, revolution, storming the Bastille, the revolution. And this is uh, one of uh, one of the allegories is the fatherland and the other one is religion here that are both sides kind of watching him. But it's really, it's a really cool one. Um, sometimes this is open and you could go in there and there's like this little uh, pack here that gives you a little bit more information, but it's just right here. And he died, look at that light up there. You see that? the sun oh so pretty um and the street that goes right over here in front of a, one of my favorite restaurants Le Fumoir and in front of the uh Saint Germain Laxoir that street is also named for him so uh, I'm gonna try to warm my hand up here for a second and you know what this is of course we are here at the Louvre, and this is a Rue de Rivoli. Last week, I took you guys to those columns, those uh, the the uh, Rue de Colon. Those, if you remember seeing those, those were actually the inspiration here for the ones here on the Rue de Rivoli. So it all cut, keeps tying together. But the Rue de Rivoli was named after Napoleon's um, victory over Rivoli in Italy. It was his victory over Austria there in Italy. And so he decided he was the one who originally spearheaded the building of this street. Um, but he didn't get it finished. He started the upper part of it, but he, um, it would be, it would take from Napoleon III for it to create the site, but it was also very, it was very narrow. It was not this wide at the time. Um, why don't we go ahead and cross here? Whatever is going, I think it's still going on up there. Okay, let's see. Sometimes they're very nice and they'll let you go, but then I say, oh, no, no, it's okay. And then they get annoyed. <laughs> so this whole backside the Louvre, this part that you're looking at here, this is the Richelieu wing. This part right here was done by Louis XIV. And then we go down here. This is of course the back, this is the Poitare. This is, well, this is, I'm sorry, this is uh, backside's the Sully. And then we go into Richelieu. So this is the Sully wing. The second floor is all French paintings. I love it. Oh, we're going to go walking right into the wind for a bit. This is the Jardin de Oratoire, which is, of course, named after the church right behind us. And this side here was also done by Napoleon III. And the one there's only a little bit of it that Napoleon Bonaparte did. And that one little part of it is this kind of over here where it kind of jerk bumps out a little bit here. That was at one point the chapel. So that was I'm losing my bag here. That was the chapel of the Louvre that he wanted to have built. And it never really fully came to fruition because he ended up getting kicked out. So it never was finished. Now that's just kind of where it links to the Sully to the Richelieu wing. This is the back side entrance. This is where the employees come and go. You can hear very loud music. So it's probably something in the square up here. This side, all along this was all done by Napoleon III. So technically, the Louvre, this is the newest part. So this was done in the mid 19th century. And this was all part of the ministry until 1989. 
So there was actually offices in here from the time of Napoleon III when they created this up until 1989. So it's actually gonna be big anniversary this year of the Louvre and also for the Richelieu. year. I think we're listening to uh, who was that Black Eyed Keith? You can see some of the uh, French statues in there. See Napoleon, I love this girl. Oh, gosh, you guys. Oh. <laughs> we're just popping in here. See a lot of pace. Uh oh. Oh no, you guys. Oh no. It closed off. Okay, well, now I'm really sad because the whole reason I wanted to do this was share this with you guys. So I'll have to post all the pictures um, of it. But I was going to take you in there and I will do, I was going to go in tomorrow morning and make a video of the inside of it. But I was going to take you in there and show you those pieces of the statue that were uh, here and now in the Louvre because they were taken, um, they were saved from the Place de Victoire and probably because of this doggone demonstration, they've got the courtyard closed off. They don't want anybody in there. So that, oh, I'm so bummed out. That was the whole reason why I wanted to do it. Oh, well, these things, see, I told you, you gotta go with the flow, right? Um, I'll take you back here to the Cor Carré, uh, which has had a birthday the other day when it was inaugurated, not that long ago, <laughs> 1993. Ooh. I get maybe, oh, I'm so bummed out. Oh, well. I'll go in the morning and make a video and explain to you guys. It's really cool. They have. So the four captives that um, were at the base and I saw a, I found a really cool etching um, that I have saved from, that I got in one of the, uh, in the etchings department library of the Louvre when I went in there a couple of years ago to do some research. And so they had these four captives, which is a big thing they did on statues back then. And the four different captives are four men and they mean a few different things. So. They, each one represents a country that he conquered. So there's the empire, Spain, uh, Brandon, Brandenburg. I said that, I think I said the wrong name earlier. Brandenburg and the empire. And, but each one of those men also depict a different stage of life. So the empire is old, but he's also a different feeling. So he's resigned. The empire is middle-aged and he's anger. Then you have the Brandberg, who is an adult, and he is um, abatement. And then the youngest is Spain, and he is a young, handsome guy, but he also represents hope. So it's really, really cool um, to see them and just kind of when you know that, how to look at them. Um, and you, I mean, you definitely get that sense of them, you know, the old guy is kind of just had his head down. It just looks like he's just, that's it. He's given up. <laughs> and the young guy that's also Hope is looking up. Um, yeah. And they're just, it's really, really cool. So they're all done in bronze. Um, and they're just there in the Corpuget, which will celebrate its 30th birthday this year in November, um, because that was parking lot for the Ministry of Finance that had been there. In 1989, and it was a perfect place for IMP to redo because it was um, ground level, and it was going to be a great place that they could put all those extremely heavy uh, marble statues that date between the 16th and 19th century. So here is a core carry. 
of that light over there. Beautiful. I hope I find a space without the wind for a second. Well, I'm really bummed out, guys, that we that I couldn't take you guys in there. But I will make a video tomorrow, and I'll share a ton of photos um, on also on the monument. So you have the four uh, captives, and then on the wall behind it, you have ten medallions, and those medallions also used to be in the Place de Victoire, and they used to have four huge lamp posts, and those lamp posts were made of. Um, the columns were made of marble and they were on a rose marble base and on the columns on each one of them was eight different medallions and so the Louvre has 10 we don't know really where the other ones were but some of them are actually given by um the queen of england queen victoria um and they uh we don't know where the other ones are but they saved um four of the columns are in the uh, church that's uh, the uh, Notre Dame de Saint. So now I put that on my list. I want to go down there just to see the columns in the church. Um, but it's really cool that they have those here. There was also four bas relief uh, plaques that went on the base of the uh, statue of, Nepo of uh, Louis that I mentioned. And those are here as well. So between the captives and all those pieces, there's 41 pieces that were once on that statue of Napoleon, why do I keep saying Napoleon, um, on the statue of Louis XIV. But we don't have anything left to the Louis XIV statue, but we do have all these other pieces. And then when you kind of know the story of, um, you know, what, what he was conquering and what they were doing, they ended up, Spain was kind of the big loser in that whole treaty because they were forced to give a lot of things back. Uh, uh, Louis XIV ended up giving back uh, to Holland all the things that he had taken. But uh, Louis XIV won from Spain, the uh, Franche Comte area. He also got a lot of the northern part of what is now northern France, a lot of those cities. So it was a pretty, uh, a pretty big coup for him. And a lot of that stuff is still um, in, uh, in, in considered France. So, you know, some places like Alsace is famous for bouncing back and forth between Germany and, and France for years and years. I guess I can see if we can see. But the loop is closed now, so that's probably the close, that's probably close by date. Um, well, it would be closing right about now. But maybe they just had that ex exit closed. And you can see the pyramid and everything there. Just a beautiful night. So next week, I am i haven't thought about what we're doing, but I will think about that. I get that posted um, probably tomorrow. You can always find it on my Facebook page and always on my website under events. So ClaudiaHemingway.com under events. You could also find all that stuff. And I thought I was going to be so excited to use this fancy, very fancy little camera I got that actually is a tiny camera on a built-in gimbal. It's not any, it's actually smaller than my phone on this little tripod I hold. Um, and I was all excited, it was testing it out. And I have to have another piece of it for it so it could actually do go online, do a live stream. So I had to order that. Um, and in the end, I think this little, getting this little camera to work and um, everything I needed for it's gonna be about $800, which I don't know if I would have done it had I gone into thinking that's how much all of that was gonna cost. So the other piece is going to come this week. And so I'm really hoping it's going to work and we could do it for next week. I just have to see how I could um, live stream on it and where, because I think, uh, get that light. It is, uh, I'll just have to see if I could do it onto YouTube. I don't have enough subscribers. So if you can make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube, Claudine Blue Ball Root, and share it with everybody to get them to subscribe. Because I don't think I have enough people to actually do it directly onto YouTube. So if you could share that, that'd be great. Um, and if you want to support this um, and all of the content I put out, I think I probably put out more free content every single week than any of the, anybody else that ever does anything that's uh, French content between the podcast, my newsletter every week that is always a novel, and my posts I share every single day on Instagram, and also the live videos and walks, and everything I do in my storage with sometimes are 50 or 60 pictures in my Instagram stories. Um, and I do all of that for you for free. So 
So I'd like to hopefully keep it that way. And so to do that, um, if you could support me, that'd be amazing. You could do it too. If you want to leave a, a little tip in the tip jar, you could do that at Venmo or PayPal at Claudine at ClaudineHemingway.com or even better yet, join my Patreon because um, I love to be able to share all this with everybody and would love to be able to keep it. So it's free for everybody. So if I had your support, that'd be great. And that's it today. Look at that light, so gorgeous. So I will leave you guys here and um, hopefully see you uh, this next weekend. Oh, and tomorrow's podcast, I kind of teased it earlier, but I mentioned Madame de uh, Montespan because Madame de Montespan was involved in the poison affairs. And the poison affairs was a big thing that came through here through France in the 17th century. And it, and it even rocked Versailles and Louis the 14th. And they even had found out that Louis the 14th had been poisoned for years. Uh, so the affair of the poisons um, was a pretty huge deal. A lot of people were killed for, because of it, because of the poisons and then also because of their actions. Um, but it's a special two part episode um, on uh, the podcast. So check that out. And if you missed the last two episodes we did in the last two weeks was about Henri Desiree Landru, who was a uh, serial killer here in France. And so that's a very interesting, um, a very interesting story. So um, definitely check it out um, and check that out on the podcast tomorrow. And so I hope to see you. And if you aren't subscribed to the newsletter, check that out as well. Um, I think maybe I'm actually going to share more about the statue. So Make sure you're subscribed to it because I will, um, I think that's where I'm going to, I'll post the video um, that I'm going to make tomorrow morning in the Louvre of that statue and of the leftover of the statues from Louis the 14th. And then I think I'll just also put all that in the newsletter because I'll explain to you what each of the plaques mean and all of the goodness of that statue because it would be way too much to try to put um, on Instagram or anywhere else. So thank you guys so, so much for joining me today. I am going to hopefully go and warm up and maybe go someplace and get some very, very hot soup because my fingers, uh, my hands are literally red. And I also have a really bad, uh, um, what is that called? <laughs> Circulation issues. <laughs> so this was probably the worst idea today to do this um, when it was as cold, but, um, or just really stupid of me to fi finish uh, to do this without having any gloves on. But um, my toes are literally frozen and it feels like I'm walking on um, pieces of ice. So I'm gonna go warm up and uh, I will see you guys all soon. And thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you, Chrissy, for helping out. Um, I'm sure you were helping answer some questions in there because I don't see anything here on the Zoom on my phone. But thank you guys so, so, so much and have a wonderful week and the rest of February. And I will see you guys next week.